and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. Well, happy seventh day of Christmas. The world moved on from Christmas as of my guest last Monday afternoon. The world loves to rush into Christmas and then they love to rush out of it just as soon as they got there. And though we are tempted to join in with them, let's try not to, not just yet. For on the eighth day of Christmas, that being tomorrow, we remember Christ's circumcision and his naming ceremony, both of which are recorded in one little verse in the Bible, Luke 2, 21, which you just heard. By that time, all of the angels have gone back to heaven. The shepherds, they've gone back to tending their flocks. Mary is on the mend from giving birth without an epidural, mind you. But she's young. She'll bounce back. And it's time for the Holy Family to have their little baby boy circumcised and named. It seems more like a footnote than a major event. I mean, so why on earth has the Christian church made this a part of the Christmas season? I mean, why make a big deal about the removal of a little piece of skin from a little baby boy? Well, because that baby boy was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what it teaches us is incredibly good news and it is quite comforting. The practice of circumcision spans back to Genesis 17. It's when the Lord told Abram, later to become Abraham, but at this point told Abram, who was 99 years old, he said this, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your seed after you. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male, the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Human reason sneers at such a practice. But God tends to tweak our fallen human reason and He chooses things that human reason has a hard time grasping. Attaching His best promises to, th to things that seem the most humble, the most mundane, the most obscure, causing us to live by faith and not by sight. <coughs> So, to be a child of God, God said you must be circumcised. If you're going to be in the community, you must abide by the covenant. And this procedure forever marked one as one of us, separating Abram and his descendants from all the other nations as God's chosen people. Well, then when you jump way ahead, just hear what St. Paul says. He says, And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So circumcision places one under the entire law, binding him to keep it fully, perfectly, or die. So this means that when Jesus is circumcised, it is the very first time that a boy is bound to the law who will ultimately keep it. And he will keep all of it. 
Every jot, every tittle, all the other Jewish boys, they would see this physical mark upon themselves and it would remind them that he was a sinner, and that he couldn't keep the law. He was in need of God's mercy, but not Jesus. Jesus was sinless, born without the seed of human father, meaning that original sin was not imputed to him. Completely like us, enveloped in our flesh and our blood, yet without sin. Now, beloved, this might seem convoluted to you, especially to us. I mean, as Gentiles, for crying out loud. But Jesus is fulfilling the law at eight days old. And this is why I would argue that God placed him in the family that he was placed in with pious Joseph and pious and faithful Mary. God the Father knew that Joseph and Mary would take him to be circumcised and to be named and take him to synagogue. He'd go to vacation Bible school. He would grow up reading the Torah. Here he is at eight days old, and he is fulfilling the law, embarking on a lifelong journey of obedience, not as an example to us, but rather as a substitute for us. That's the big point for this sermon. You grasp that, you get it. Somebody says today, what'd you learn at church? Well, it was the circumcision of Jesus. What? You did that at church? Yeah, that's what we focused on. Why? What's the big deal? Because he wasn't, our, he wasn't our example for us. He was our substitute for us. Wow. Even at eight days old. And this is the day that the Old Testament foreshadowed, the day when the son of Abraham would be brought under the covenant, under the testament, under the law that God had given to Abraham and to Moses with all of its promised blessings for obedience and with all of its promised curses for disobedience. This was the day that the son of God entered into the Old Testament to fulfill it and later replace it with a new and better testament, the new testament in his blood. You'll hear it in just a few moments. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Blood that was first shed on the day of his circumcision. A token of the blood that would be spilled about 33 years later on the cross. Now concerning this, St. Paul is very succinct. He says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were born under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So how do we receive this adoption? St. Paul continues, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All right, tell us, tell us how. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, believing in Him as their Savior from sin, they now inherit everything that Christ won. Everything! So do you see it? He has given us a better sacrament than that of circumcision. Unlike circumcision, baptism is for all, and it is proclaimed to all nations. Baptism is for boys, and it's for girls, it's for men, it's for women, it's for eight days old, it's for 80 years old. Baptism, unlike circumcision, requires no pain, no bloodshed, because all the pain of our sins has already been endured by Christ, and all the blood 
that was needed to be shed has already been shed by him. And so what we're left with in baptism is, as we're taught in the catechism, a life-giving water rich in grace and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. Baptism is God's promise to count you as part of Jesus, as part of the seed of Abraham. And this is why St. Mark can say, all who believe and are baptized will be saved. So to conclude, Jesus was born for your good and he suffered for your good. His obedience is precisely the undoing of Adam's sin as Adam brought all of humanity into sin and to death. So Jesus takes all of humanity into justification and life. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. He kept the law perfectly in your place even at eight days old. And that perfect obedience, that's yours. It's your clothing. It's your covering. It is your justification before God. Leaving you free to be who you really are in Christ. Free to do the goodness and the mercy of God for your neighbor. Free even to lay down your own life in service of others. Not to please God or to earn His favor or His forgiveness. Because in Christ it's already yours and you have nothing in this world left to lose. You have been buried with Him in baptism. You have been clothed with Him. His name has been placed upon you, for He is your head. You have been made alive. You have been given a new birth. Circumcision has no further mandate in the Christian church, just as animal sacrifices now have no place either. Christ is the end. Christ is the fulfillment. And you are released from the curse of the law by your Lord and your Savior. So praise be to God for all that He has done for the likes of us. In the holy name of Jesus, Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Stand together.